Thank you, uh, Corey. This, is, uh, this has been an incredibly uh, interesting morning, I think, for, uh, for many of us. Uh, not the least of which the fact that I've gotten to see myself twice in cartoon form, and I don't think either one really looked like me, but like any good bar mitzvah, uh, they are having caricatures done in the uh, room across the hall back there. So I encourage you all uh, to go there. We've really learned a lot this morning. Uh, we've learned that Mount Sinai uh, can change quite a bit. We have that great new logo that's down there in the lower right on my uh, first slide there. Uh, we've heard uh, Bruce Sands give a ding to Cyclosporin, so Mount Sinai has evolved quite a way. New logo, not committed to Cyclosporin. Uh, we heard Osher Kornbluth advocate the use of steroids. Very, very good. We also learned that Bill Sanborn thinks Osher is good looking. Uh, I thought that was really one of our better uh, points today. Uh, like Bill, I am challenged here this morning uh, facing a taller, better looking, I do think Miguel is good looking. Uh, better looking, uh, smarter uh, opponent, uh, and I too, like Osher, got the bad side of the argument here. Uh, not quite the commode, uh, but, uh, but pretty close to it. Um, Miguel has spent a lot of time this morning um, talking to you guys about some of the findings uh, in, uh, in, in his studies, and he's really the one who's been advocating nothing short of smoke and mirrors. Uh, he showed you the beautiful picture of Pittsburgh uh, on a sunny summer morning. Uh, and he showed the Hogwarts-looking uh, Mount Sinai, uh, looking pretty dreary uh, on that particular day. Uh, but I must tell you, I went out to Pittsburgh a couple years ago. Miguel will attest to this fact. Uh, they had a nice talk lined up for me. Miguel and Rocky had invited me out. It was really great to be there. Couldn't give the talk, though. There was a shooting that day at, uh, uh, at Pittsburgh. Is that right, Miguel? Yeah, he's nodding. So. so um, I'm here to tell you that which you already know, uh, and, and something that uh, Voldemort over there, uh, he who shall be nameless, uh, tried to uh, disabuse you of what it is that you already know, and that's that medications should not be stopped for Crohn's disease patients who are in remission. We're going to look at some of the same data, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that you'll come to agree with me. Um, we all really know well uh, already the reasons to start immunomodulators and anti-TNFs in Crohn's disease, certainly in patients who are steroid dependent or steroid refractory, always a good reason. Penetrating and fistulizing disease, symptomatic disease not responsive to other medicines. We want to try to minimize mucosal inflammation, and if all goes well, um, forgetting things like Crohn's disease activity indices and other such indices, what we'd really like to prevent uh, and we are cost conscious. Uh, we'd like to prevent surgery, hospitalization, work school, absenteeism, and most important, improve the quality of life of the patients who we take care of. So there are some reasons to continue, and those are obvious. We want to minimize complications. We want to minimize steroid exposure. That whole business of, well, half do great, and you know, Miguel tried to fool you uh, about data of the placebo effect, and the placebo effect might be important, but what do you failed to mention in all those studies is that continuing therapy always was superior to stopping therapy, even though some who continued probably did benefit from a steroid uh, placebo effect. Uh, we want to maintain remission, and that's really what's important here, and that's what we're talking about, and we want to maintain that good quality of life. Uh, there are good reasons to want to discontinue, uh, and certainly avoiding potential toxicity like infections and malignancy are important. But it's also important to remember that if we fail, and we do fail often, as noticed in those studies that Miguel presented earlier, what we're doing is we're increasing the risk of steroid exposure and increasing the risk of infections and malignancies, sometimes even when we stop to avoid those same things. This has never really been put to the test in a clinical trial in terms of what happens. And none of the studies uh, that, uh, that he or I will be presenting to you have shown an overall difference in the rate of infection or malignancy, whether you stop or continue. And so we really don't have those data. Uh, cost, certainly a big concern, uh, but I think, you know, for now, while it's always important to think about uh, systematic cost, uh, we're going to really stick to what's, what's good for the patient here at this point in time. Uh, and then, obviously, there is a huge issue with the inconvenience of taking uh, some of these medicines over time, and that's really what patients would prefer to avoid uh, and what we would prefer to avoid for them. So what do the data tell us? Well. The results from the literature uh, are there for a certain number of these issues. Uh, it shows that stopping thiopurines as monotherapy is a bad idea. It shows that stopping thiopurines in combination therapy, uh, as Miguel showed you before from a number of studies, 
is at the very least sort of a bad idea. Uh, certainly it's not neutral. Uh, and then finally, that stopping anti-TNFs in monotherapy is a really bad idea, uh, and then stopping anti-TNFs in combination therapy is a bad idea also. Uh, we don't have results yet from the literature concerning stopping methotrexate uh, as mono or combination therapy, uh, and we don't have any data uh, to discuss natalizumab or vetalizumab. So stopping thiopurines in monotherapy, uh, and this was the Le Mans study. These are patients who were in long, durable remissions uh, who, who had previously uh, been on uh, steroids, and certainly some could still be on steroids. Uh, most of this was in the pre-biologic era, but uh, they, weren't, uh, uh, they weren't really on any other therapies. Uh, and, and patients were randomized either to continue their azathioprine or take a placebo. And the important point here is that this was a non-inferiority study, uh, and they measured those who relapsed uh, over time. Uh, and what you see here is that while there was no statistical difference, they couldn't exclude the possibility of non-inferiority. And you can see that patients, at least visually on these Kaplan-Meier curves, really did much better if they continued azathioprine as opposed to getting a placebo. Uh, and you know, this is certainly a really important deal here, 10% difference, right? We have approved medicines. The FDA has approved medicines based on 10% differences over time. So, Really, we don't want to stop azathioprines. Now, what about in combination therapy? Uh, Miguel showed you this uh, Van Asch uh, study that we're all certainly very familiar with. Uh, it was in gastro a number of years ago uh, when the pendulum looked like it was swinging toward monotherapy uh, over time. And what you could see, and Miguel already showed you a version of this slide, uh, is that there seemed to be no difference between the two groups. Uh, but what he failed to show you is that some of these really important surrogate markers for continued success over time really differed between the two groups. And what you saw was that elevations in CRP on the right uh, and, elevation, and, and depressions of uh, infliximab levels were really there for our patients who were really, uh, who, in, in whom uh, azathioprine was withdrawn. So if you take azathioprine away, uh, these other markers that will really correlate very nicely with subsequent failure are all in favor of continuing combination therapy. So you really want to continue. What about stopping anti-TNFs in combination therapy? Well, there's really not a lot out there. He showed you those four studies uh, that have been published. I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. And this was the STORY trial. What you see here is about a 50% uh, risk of relapse at one year. And this was true in the Molnar study. This was true in the WA study. This was true on the Steenholt study that he showed you as well really very, very disappointing. 50% at one year, uh, that's really putting your patients at risk for steroids, risk for meaningful flares that could leave them hospitalized, risk for all sorts of badness. Sure, some of that, uh, you know, in, in the other 50% looks good, but uh, it's really just too much to ask. Uh, in this WA study of Canadian patients, uh, as he showed you, not all of whom were on combination therapy, but the great majority were, uh, you can see that very, very, very steep bit of the curve that happens in the first year of withdrawal. Uh, very disappointing. So, he who shall be nameless did a really nice study. Uh, and this was his long-term follow-up study for patients in what he termed the deepest remission. Very, very cute, Miguel. I did like uh, this concept of a deepest remission. Uh, and Steve referred to this earlier. Uh, deepest remission was obtained through surgical excision. Uh, and, and, and the conclusion that he came up with was don't stop your anti-TNF even after the deepest remission. Five-year follow-up post-operative study for infliximab. This was uh, the follow-up from uh, the University of Pittsburgh's landmark study in 2009 before the shooting. Uh, all subjects were offered open-label infliximab and followed for an additional four years. They looked at all of the outcomes that uh, really would matter in such a study, both endoscopic recurrence and surgical recurrence. And let's take a little look there. So uh, those uh, who were initially on infliximab, who continued infliximab for the subsequent years of this study, none of those patients recurred, zero of seven. For those who continued infliximab and then stopped after a year, four of five of them had endoscopic recurrence at five years, and four of five of them had surgical recurrence after five years. Those who were on placebo, who started on infliximab after their one-year follow-up, uh, they did much better than they had done, because you, you might recall that 11 of 13 of them, if my numbers are right, uh, had uh, uh, initially had uh, evidence of endoscopic recurrence. Three withdrew, and then 10 went on and 
started on infliximab at year one, uh, and they did pretty well. 30% uh, had benefit out at five years. And those who continued off of infliximab, well, they continued to do poorly. Pretty clear from this study, pretty clear from this study that patients need to be continued uh, on anti-TNFs after achieving the deepest of deep remissions. So thank you, Miguel, for that. Uh, excuse me, you shall be nameless. So what do the data tell us? This is the slide I had before. It's just a duplicate version, right? Stopping thiopurines as monotherapy is a bad idea. Stopping thiopurines in combination therapy, sort of a bad idea. Stopping anti-TNFs as monotherapy, a really bad idea. And then stopping anti-TNFs in combination therapy, also a bad idea. We don't have those other data. It is alleged that Yogi Berra, who has so many things that teach us uh, things in medicine, and uh, while you don't have my CV in front of you, I did go to the Yogi Berra School of Medicine. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? We all know that to be true. Unfortunately, Yogi Berra didn't say it. Bert Lance said it. He was the uh, budget director uh, for Jimmy Carter back in the, in the 70s, but it doesn't matter. The point remains the same. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. A deepest remission doesn't really help you. Um, I want to thank you for this. I'm looking forward to our, uh, our spirited discussion of these issues later. I want to thank Jean-Fred and, uh, and, and Steve. Uh, and, and I had trouble listening to Jean-Fred through that heavy Yiddish accent that he's acquired uh, in New York. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody who went before me. This is really a great morning.